Um, hello, yes, so I'm Lucy Broom. I work for a company called OxyTech, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about vector control in urban areas. And to do that, I'm going to use an example of our Aedes aegypti program, um, of which we've currently got quite a big field trial going on in Brazil. Um, so what OxyTech aims to do is we aim to provide insect control through novel technology, and, and this should improve both human health but also food quality. So we have an agricultural and a public health side to the company. We aim to do this by reducing the insect population, and we do this using a genetic approach that is sustainable, economic, and you can apply it to many different insect species worldwide. This is, in essence, how our technology works. So we take an insect embryo, an egg, effectively. We inject it with a plasmid that contains a couple of different genes. One of these is what we call a self-limiting gene. What this means is any insect which inherits this gene will not survive through to adulthood. It will effectively be um, a sterile insect. It will not produce viable offspring unless it is raised on an antidote, which I'll explain about in a minute. The other gene we insert is just a fluorescent marker. So it's just a fluorescent protein. This means our genetically modified insects fluoresce, and this is really important. It means we're able to track our insects within the environment but also we're able to use them as a tool to monitor the pest population in areas we treat. Um, and I'll show you a bit about that in a minute. So how it basically works is we generate a sterile insect, in this case a mosquito. We release only males because male mosquitoes don't bite. Our male sterile males um, mate with the wild type female Anopheles, and, um, Aedes, beg your pardon, in the field. Um, and then these females go and lay eggs, but the eggs do not develop through to adulthood. So the insect population drops. This decreases the insect population. When we stop releasing our insects, they die within a week or two of being released. And this means that the GM insects are effectively removed back out of that population. And we're able to check that happens by monitoring for the presence of fluorescent larvae in our ovi traps, which will not survive through to adulthood. Um, so why do we target Aedes aegypti? It's one of our products. Um, so this is an urban pest. Um, it can breed in as small a water source as a discarded bottle cap, which means if you're going to start treating um, water ovi position sites, these mosquitoes lay their eggs in water, um, it's quite difficult to treat all of the water sites um, well in a very urban environment. In addition, it's a day-biting mosquito. So insecticide-treated bed nets, which can be very effective against other species, are not so good against Aedes. They're biting when the people are out and about and walking around. And also, this mosquito tends to live within human habitation. It particularly likes humans as a vector. You often find them inside houses. So when you are spraying pesticide to try and control the population, if you want to spray this mosquito, you have to spray inside people's houses. So when spray trucks go along the roads outside, most people shut their windows. And so it's quite difficult to target this particular vector with the more conventional means of insect control. This opens up an area for improvement, um, one of which we think could be used for our technology. So Aedes is a vector of several different diseases. Dengue fever, which can affect 40% of the global population at the moment. Zika virus, which has obviously been in the news a lot in the last two years and also chikungunya, which is arguably a bit more neglected, not often recognized as much as some of the other two. But again, if you look here, a case, one case in um, India infected 1.5 million people. So there's some severe suffering going on with these diseases. The pie chart at the bottom shows you um, the cost of these diseases, in this case, dengue, to the community. So as you can see, this is the cost of controlling the vector by conventional means, such as pesticide spraying, treating oviposition sites, it's only a fraction of the total cost to the community. The rest of this is made up of health care, lost earnings, supporting family members when the normal support to the family is ill. Um, so there is a lot of reasons to target this mosquito. Um, so we have released this mosquito in several different field trials around the world today, always with permission. We get regulatory permission. We've had really good success so far. So um, in these five cases, we've managed to suppress over 90% of the insect population. This is insect population data. It is not epidemiological data. We don't make that claim. We do want to do a clinical trial eventually, but we haven't got to that stage yet with our company. It's fairly new. Um, but this was obviously uh, a very good starting point. Um, 
We now have a large-scale field trial going on in Piracicaba in Brazil. That's a very urban area. So to explain how that works to you, this is in general how our program would work. So we have an egg factory. Effectively, this can either be um, in the UK, we've got one here, we've got one in Brazil, or it can be as simple as a shipping container that can be used to rear mosquitoes easily, shipped out to a more remote location. In here, we hatch our eggs. We manually sort the mosquitoes um, at the pupil stage, so we separate out all the females. We will not release any females, it's very important. Um, so we only release males, which do not bite. Um, these are loaded into pots, which go into these distribution vehicles. It can be a car or a van. And this will drive around the neighborhood we want to treat. And the mosquitoes are simply blown out the window with a fan at prescribed points. Out they go, don't bite anyone, off they go to seek out females and mate with them in the wild. Um, we have an app, which we've developed for an iPad or a tablet. So this is um, in with the van driver. And um, I'll show you some more of that in a minute. But basically, this tells him where to release throughout the city. Um, uh, males disperse, mate with the wild females, and these females go and lay eggs. Throughout the same area, we have distributed ovi traps, which are kind of, um, they're basically buckets of water, a little bit more than that. Um, the mosquito females will lay their eggs into these buckets, which will hatch into larvae. We go out and we collect these larvae, take them back, and we screen them. So we look for that fluorescent protein. And this allows us to tell two different things. So the proportion of the larvae that are fluorescent in that bucket, the proportion that are not fluorescent tells us the size of the current existing wild mosquito population. Obviously, the proportion of our own larvae tells us how well our males are mating, how well it's going. Um, if they're all fluorescent, we can scale back the number of males we release. If there's a lot of non-fluorescent larvae in that bucket, we know we need to release more males. So this feeds back into the factory and we produce more mosquitoes and we release greater numbers, specifically in the areas where the ovi traps show there are more wild mosquitoes. So the whole cycle feeds round and round. Here are some pictures. This is our um, egg factory in Brazil at the moment, in Piracicaba. The capacity is 60 million male mosquitoes a week. Oh no, sorry, mos 60 million mosquitoes, half of which will be male, beg your pardon. Um, we have, this is the kind of the rearing system, so this is effectively an aquaculture system for the larvae. The water filters down, we put food in. In this manner you can um, cheaply and effectively raise millions with just a few staff. These are the pots the adults are in, this chap is loading them up to put them into a van. And uh, this is how we distribute, so you'll have a regional hub in some of our field trials that might just be a shipping container. Um, in Piracicaba, it's our egg factory. Uh, they go into the vans or the cars, and they'll go out to specific locations around the town, and this is, this is how they're released. This is a man just blowing them out the window. It's very simple technology. So we have local people trained to do these jobs. We work with, um, I can never say this word. We work with the government out there. <laughs> um, and we, we get them involved too. So only some of the people out there are employed by us um, and some are by the government. These are just the uh, cages of adults laying their eggs. Um, so a little bit more on our app. So we developed this app to go on the tablet, as I said. Um, and this tells the van driver where to stop so someone can release the mosquitoes. Um, this is an example of an area we're treating. So we've divided the city up into different domains, um, which we monitor separately. Each of these dots represents an ovi trap and a point at which the van would be releasing mosquitoes. The red ones indicate the, um, a particularly high wild mosquito population, which is taken from the previous week's data from our ovi trap. So at these areas, you will release more mosquitoes than at these areas, but you will release some everywhere while you're treating that domain. Um, so monitoring these hotspots and using the GPS data in this manner allows us to adapt our release fairly quickly to what's going on in the field. Here's um, a couple of examples of our data from two areas. So these are two different areas in Piracicaba, CCAP and Seo Judas. Um, this one here, Alvarada, is a control area within the city. So it's an area where we don't release our mosquitoes just so we can see what the wild population would be doing if we weren't involved. Um, all of these areas still have normal pesticide spraying, other control measures going on, but with our measures on top. Um, here you've got, so it's important to monitor this data um, for quite a while to see what's going on because you have a wet and a dry season. 
And in the wet season, your mosquito population will naturally go up, and then it will go down again. So if you catch it at this point, you might think it's going down, because of you, that might not be the case. So we have peaks here. Um, but basically, the red lines in both these graphs are our control areas. This is the uh, number of wild, non-fluorescent larvae in our buckets. The green areas are our treated areas. This is sea cap. This is um, Seo Judas. And as you can see, in both of these cases, um, we've produced quite a large reduction in the mosquito population, which appears to be due to um, our technology. So that's really positive. Um, so we've been doing this trial for about two years now. Um, we'll continue to do it see where it goes. Once you've initially decreased that mosquito population down to a low level, you have a few different options to keep it low, which would potentially be cheaper, more cost effective, and we call this the maintenance phase. We're not onto this yet, but for example, you could continue to release them at a low level around the city. You could adapt which um, strategy you choose to your type of urban area. Um, you could treat likely hotspots, um, places, for example, like bus stations. We find we get a lot more wild mosquitoes. We think they actually get on the bus with the people. They're day biters and they get off. And the people get off the bus, so no matter how many you release, there's always going to be a few around there that you can target. Or this would be, for example, if you were treating an island, which we've done on some of our field trials that are smaller trials. Um, you could look at areas of likely immigration of mosquitoes back into the area. Um, or you can just kind of monitor everywhere, as we do at the moment, and treat. Um, so we're going to look at doing three more big trials soon, Brazil, Colombia, and India. Um, we're also trying to get permission to do some work in the States. We've got regulatory permission from the FDA. We got approval, I think it was last year now. Um, we're now applying to the EPA for approval, and that would be looking at treating places like Florida and Texas, where Aedes aegypti is also present. Um, so I hope that was interesting and uh, thanks very much. Mm -hmm.